Eight gyms stand before me and greatness. A chance at the legendary title of Pokemon Champion. And to be inducted into the Kanto Region Hall of Fame. But make no mistake, these eight gym leaders are some of the most revered Pokemon trainers in the entire region. They are each and every one masters of their respective fields, deserving of not only your admiration, but your respect. After all, being a gym leader comes with the expectation that you can gatekeep your badge, and by extension, the Pokemon League, from most trainers. But I'm not most trainers. In fact, not one of these gym leaders has ever faced off against someone like me, a trainer who truly knows no bounds. On my quest for glory, there is no technique too forbidden. There is nowhere I will not go. There is nothing I will not do to achieve my goal. Today, I am going to desecrate these eight gyms and lay waste to the entire Kanto region on a crusade to be the very best like no one ever was. Welcome to my completely normal Pokemon Blue playthrough. Smiley face. By the time I'm done with this utter decimation, you will all remember my name. Let it be etched into the Kanto Halls of Fame for all eternity. The greatest trainer to ever grace this planet was- oh, uh. That's my name and I'm sticking to it. As for our rival, well, his name is gonna be- <laughs> I will not be taking questions at this time. And with that, my very own Pokemon legend is about to unfold. Fold. A legend of untold destruction and blasphemy. <laughs> Let's go! Okay, so the first thing you're gonna want to do on any playthrough of Pokemon Blue is to retrieve the suspicious post. Fuck. <laughs> I've never had someone fuck up three words. Yeah, I think I'm just gonna do it myself, John. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna want to do on any playthrough of Pokemon Blue is to retrieve the suspicious potion. Who put it there? And how did it get in my computer? I don't have the answers. In fact, I don't even have a Pokemon yet. Speaking of, let's talk in depth about each starter Pokemon, going over their individual strengths and weaknesses so as to fully optimize our run. Just kidding, I'm picking Bulbasaur. They might not look like much, but this Bulbasaur will be the Pokemon responsible for sowing the initial seeds of chaos. This Bulbasaur is the physical representation of our plan's potential, tightly locked away, ready to flower at any moment. And do I want to give a nickname to Bulbasaur? Do I? E. e. And with that out the way, it's time for our first trainer battle. Now Charmander does outspeed me and so will always go first, but luckily for me, is literally just a 10 year old, so spamming tackle is just a winning strategy. As long as I don't get left on six HP, this is an easy, oh, okay, that complicates things. Charmander knows one attack, Scratch. If Scratch crits, it hits for a six. So just use the suspicious potion you're thinking, right? <laughs> No, no, I was just kidding. This doesn't complicate things in the slightest because every move I make is decisive and calculated. Something you need to understand is in here, in this game, there is no force above me, not even luck. In here, everything bends to my will and I call it fate. Charmander fucking dies. Nice. E gains 69 XP. Nice. And is defeated. Oh, what? Unbelievable. I picked the wrong Pokemon. Okay, I'll make my Pokemon fight to toughen it up. Wah! Gramps, smell you later. I always thought that was like the weirdest song on the soundtrack. Also, all that training the rival's gonna do, it's not gonna mean anything. We're never fighting them again. So to get to Brock's gym in Pewter City, we must first travel through Viridian Forest. Unfortunately for us- You can't go through here! This is private property! There is an angry old man blocking the only path. We will have to wait until he's had his morning coffee before he will cease this illegal roadblock. And if you think this makes no sense, that's because you are correct. In the original Japanese game Pocket Monsters, the old man is actually drunk, which is why he's on the floor and why his cheeks are all blushy. Wait, listen to my story, hey. Don't go. I'm talking here. It's implied you then back away from the drunken weirdo, too uncomfortable to progress further. At least until he's sobered up, that is. In any case, we'll need to pass some time. And what better way to do that than by doing someone else's job? For no money? I'm onto you, Viridian City Pokemon owner, you little bitch. Anyway, we make our way back down Route 1 and deliver the package to Professor Oak. It is at this point Professor Oak unveils two Pokedexes, of which one is given to me so that Professor Oak can live vicariously through my discoveries whilst he stays home and bangs my mum? Man, he really knows how to have his cake and eat it too. Joke's on him though, because I have absolutely no plans on filling this Dex even slightly, because Dex is for fa- Because I'm only gonna catch five Pokemon on this run, and one of them doesn't really exist. They are 
missing, if you will. Don't worry, we'll get to all that later. But first, it's someone's birthday today. Someone very special. That's right, it's Raid Shadow Legends. In celebration of their third anniversary, I'm going to be going over my top three left arms in Raid Shadow Legends. Number three, this arm. Wow. Number two, this arm. Wow. And in at number one, well, that's an arm, all right. So what's new with Raid? Well, if I had to put it in my own words, this month, Raid is celebrating its third year anniversary, and it's going to be wow. Raid's kicking things off with free gifts for everyone, and then adding in a bunch of new content and events. We're talking new champions, wow. new artifact sets, wow. and a fully personalized video showcasing every player's Raid journey and their personal achievements. Wow, I can't wait to watch mine! If that's not enough, they've got a full month of special events and tournaments, with some of Raid's best ever prizes on offer, including badass champions, piles and piles of shards, wow. and tons of other goodies. With this anniversary event, there has never been a better time to join the Raid community. If you're not already playing like the cool kids, click a den link in de- wait. <laughs> click the link in the description or scan this QR code to get a $40 birthday package which includes 3 champions, 10 magic XP brews, 10 force XP brews, and 10 spirit brews. It'll all be waiting for you here. And don't worry existing players, I didn't forget about you. You guys can use promo code 3 years raid to get your hands on $25 worth of stuff. Click the link in the description, it's just that easy, and I'll see you in Raid Shadow Legends. Welcome to Viridian Forest. With the roadblock now clear, I was graciously allowed to continue on towards Pewter City. I purchased seven Pokeballs from the Viridian City store, which I still can't believe I was made to pay for, by the way, and entered the forest. Now, I don't consider myself to be a speedrunner, but I am guilty of speedrunner adjacent behavior such as being trained, being able to perfectly navigate Viridian Forest without getting one random encounter. Having played this game so many times, this route is just muscle memory at this point. It's like GTA San Andreas cheat codes, some things you just never forget. We do have to fight this bug catcher though. They strike fighting poses. Oh, it's Weedle! Go, E! Listen, I gotta do something to spice up these combat sequences. It's a Game Boy game. So the opponent's Weedle is three levels higher than our Bulbasaur, which might strike you as a dangerous challenge, but Weedle's only attack is Poison Sting. And it's not very effective against Bulbasaur. Our first attack crits, Weedle's String Shot fails, and then we get another crit. Unreal. But you wanna know what's better than two crits? That's right, three crits. And I haven't even started manipulating RNG yet. Needless to say, Weedle fucking dies, and Bulbasaur hits level seven. E learned leech seed. But we're not out of the woods just yet. Before we enter Pewter City, I'm going to want E to be level eight. So what better way to farm XP than against Metapods who only know ha Harden? I'm also going to swap leech seed into attack slot one and growl into attack slot three. I'm then going to growl until I have 36 PP left, tackle until I have 16 PP left, and then spam leech seed until Metapod eventually fucking dies. And if this all seems like an incredibly inefficient way to kill a Metapod, I promise you it was all necessary I will explain why later. Welcome to Pewter City. Built at the foot of a great rocky mountain, Pewter City is home to the Museum of Science and the geological spectacle Mount Moon. It should then come as no surprise that its gym leader Brock specializes in rock type Pokemon. Also, Brock rhymes with rock. So first things first, we're going to go to the Pokemart to stock up for what's to come. I'm going to buy one potion, one burn heal, one escape rope, one awakening, and one paralyze heal in that order so I can completely f my game later. And now let's go check out Mount Moon. You're a trainer, right? Brock's looking for new challengers. Follow me. I'm going to save and quit. What? No, don't, don't do that. If you have the right stuff, go take on Brock. Are you coming? So now we're gonna walk away, U-turn, and then approach the same guy from the right. I'm gonna bring up this menu, close it immediately, and talk to him one last time. Oh, this bitch again. You're a trainer, right? Brock's looking for new challengers. Follow me. 
It's really fucked up that you're doing this. So you're probably thinking, hey, weren't you about to go fight Brock? And also, what the fuck is this? Well, you are right. I am going to fight Brock, just not right now. Right now, I need to make a little detour. A little detour that was made possible thank you to our adorable little Bulbasaur. Let me explain. Normally, when you trigger the cutscene with the youngster, you are auto path to the gym after the dialogue. This happens because the game looks up the possible positions you could be standing in, and then executes the correct auto path for you to take once your position has been located in the game's RAM. During this cutscene, all your inputs are disabled except for A so that you can progress dialogue. Oh, and also start on the first frame after this dialogue box closes for some reason. Meaning, if you put the cursor into the save position before triggering this cutscene, you can save and quit during the cutscene. This lets you reboot the game and walk away, allowing you to trigger the cutscene from the right, something that was never intended to be possible. When you do this, the game attempts to look up your position in RAM to auto-path you, but since where you are standing isn't in the list of places you can be, the game soft locks and you can't do anything. Unless. If the Pokemon in the last position of your party is level 8, with 16 PP left on ability 2 and 36 PP left on ability 3, by flashing the Pokemon menu before starting this cutscene, you have actually just tricked the RAM to look up this exact square you are standing on during the cutscene position check. And since the game has no auto path planned for this scenario, you are pretty much allowed to just walk wherever you want. Of course, you need to be careful to stay reasonably in bounds, because if you don't, this happens. <laughs> Pretty cool, huh? So why are we doing this? Well, the truth is I can't beat Brock with just a level eight Bulbasaur. I mean, I could probably. Definitely, actually, I just tested it. But what I have planned is much more fun for me. So now we're in Cerulean Cave. It's at this point I'm going to change my in-game settings to fast offset for faster text and battle animations because it's time to come clean. Guys, I didn't name my Bulbasaur E because of the funny meme. Well, actually, that's only half true. I did do it for the funny meme, but also, my Bulbasaur needs to have a one character name for an RNG manipulation I'm about to perform. Remember when I was fighting that Weedle and I said, I haven't even started manipulating RNG yet. Well, what you're about to see is what I was talking about. Also, when I said that I hadn't even started manipulating RNG yet, I, I lied. lied. I had actually manipulated RNG the very moment I turned on my Game Boy. By performing 13 frame perfect inputs in a row before starting a new game, a sequence now playing in the background with input display, I can manipulate my trainer ID to be 45831. And you're probably sick of hearing this, but I will explain why I did that later. I just thought I'd show you this to familiarize you guys with the concept of RNG manipulation since this is one I did earlier. And if me telling you that you can do random strings of inputs in the menu to manipulate the outcomes or values of certain things in the game is hurting your head, it's probably time for you to leave. I've already been dumbing things down up to this point because my audience is mostly American. But from here on out, things are gonna get much more complicated. So let's get to this next next RNG manipulation sequence, which is actually going to be two RNG manipulations back to back, but here's the first one. Okay, freeze. So what did I just do? Well, to keep things simple, I pressed a specific sequence of buttons, which means that now a ditto is going to manifest on this exact square. I told you. Also pause and uh, rewind and bring back the input display. So because my Bulbasaur has a one character name, if I play literally frame perfectly and throw out a Pokeball on the earliest possible frame of this combat, I will always be in a window of time where the RNG has dictated that ditto will catch. God, I'm so sick with it. By the way, that trick is not easy. In fact, of everything that you're gonna see, this A press right here is the most difficult thing to pull off in the entire run. This is your classic, old-fashioned, homegrown, unmashable, unbufferable, frame-perfect A press. Hit it too late, no catch. Press A too early, you just fuck the RNG manipulation up. No catch. At least the pokeball throw itself is bufferable though. Anyway, I got what I came here for, so let's leave. Welcome back to Pallet Town. How's your head holding up? Still good? Hmm, that won't do. Let me show you why I needed this ditto. First, I'm going to want to find a Pokemon in the wild that only knows two moves. In this case, Rattata will do. Then I'm going to have Ditto transform into Rattata, swap these two moves in the attack menu, and then run away. The game really doesn't like it when you do that, by the way. So now I'm going to take a step to the left, flash my Pokedex to do some spooky shit, and then I'm going to look for another encounter. And because of the shenanigans we performed earlier, Ditto's attack menu now looks like this. Witness the cool trainer 
glitch. And I'm gonna keep the original game sound in for this next part, because this glitch is very audio-visual. You're gonna love it. By scrolling down until the attack changes from Cool Trainer and then backing out, you get a beautiful display of my name. It's all coming together. I'm going to flash my item menu and then scroll down my attacks until it once again changes type. From here, I'm once again going to back out, and then I'm gonna scroll down, open my items, and throw a Pokeball. And this is the real audio, by the way. Now, in the canon timeline of this video, I make this catch, but I also wanted to show you what happens if you fail it, because it's pretty funny. Failing the catch results in the Pokemon screaming in pain as it becomes even more glitched. The text box tells us it's frozen solid, but then it slowly burns to death over the next 30 or so seconds because its health bar has grown exponentially. And there is no music occurring while this happens, by the way, it's just dead silent. I'm not gonna make you sit through all of it. So like 30 seconds later when the Pokemon eventually faints, you are free to repeat the last few steps to try again and catch a glitch Rattata. A Rattata who, once caught, turns out to be Missingno. And again, this is the real game audio when you do this. What a drama queen. Also, this Missingno is actually right on. Right on this SSN. You've d just been totally SSN. Send this to five friends to not get seasick? Of course, everyone knows that if you catch Missingno, the sixth item in your bag gets 128 added to it. What do you mean you don't know that? I knew that when I was six years old. In my case, I wanted Missingno to bless my Paralyze heals, which was one of the reasons why I purchased the items in Pewter City Mart in that very specific order. And now I'm going to throw two Paralyze heals away, making it 127, and flash my Pokedex again because you already know what the fuck it is. One Missingno is not enough. Not where I'm going. I'm in pain. Go, ditto. Ditto. Oh, what have you done? So by repeating the exact same cool trainer glitch as before, we can catch another Missingno, which is going to add another 128 to my Paralyze heal for a total of over 255. And once you go over 255 in Pokemon Blue, the game literally bursts at the seams. And once you break through the underflow, reality can be what you make it. You can have whatever you want, and I want power now. First, I'm going to throw away anything that isn't already tainted. I will permit nothing pure to accompany me on this sullied road of sinners. Next, I discard 253 off the top stack of Paralyze Heal and merge the two remaining into the already abundant stacks below. And just like that, I'm in. Next, I move the second stack of Paralyze Heals all the way down past this menu into the very memory of the game and swap it with the ID slot. I then take one of these square J's and throw it on the ground. One more Pokedex flash and it's time to acquire my forbidden power. Now this might look like a basic level 4 Rattata to you, but once I activate my Cool Trainer no Jutsu, Rattata is actually level 127. And when I catch Rattata with a Master Ball, because I have those now, you come to realize, wait, that's no Rattata at all. That's a Charizard. Now we have the ultimate power. Now we can obliterate Brock. Oh, wait, actually, I've got a better idea. Okay, so I was going to walk back to Pewter City, but then it hit me. If I walk onto this tile, I can do something much more fun. Swap Charizard to the front. <laughs> There's a guy in my bucket. Toss this Paralyze Heal. In fact, toss six more stacks of Paralyze Heal. Then take this Paralyze Heal, scroll down and put it here. Find TM27 and toss 14. Swap this J with Ultra Ball. Swap HM04 with Master Ball. Swap TM52 with Burn Heal. You keeping up? Toss 19 TM52s. Swap this J with HP up. And then toss eight of these Js away. Job's done. I'm going to walk up, turn around, and talk to this guy because why would I walk to Pewter City to fight a gym leader when I can just wrap reality around myself and bring Bring one to me? Yes, you guessed it. This NPC is none other than Giovanni? Yeah, not Brock. Like I said, little detour. Giovanni opens by sending out a level 45 Rhyhorn. I send out my level 127 Charizard. These two Pokemon have the same cry, by the way, and set it to Flamethrower. It might not be very effective, but with a 82 level difference, it really doesn't matter what I do here. My Charizard is just too far out of this Indigo League. In fact, my Charizard is so powerful, it's going to get nerfed by the game in real time right here. Oh well, easy come, easy go. And here I'm gonna awkwardly swap to reconstructed audio so you don't have to hear. 
for the rest of this run. You are welcome. Anyway, if you haven't already guessed, this is a flamethrower sweep, and there are no survivors. They're all dead. Nido Queen, Nido King, and finally, Rhydon. Right on this SSN. You've d just been totally SSN again. And I'm gonna keep getting away with it too. Earth badge acquired. And now I have been banished to the void for playing God. The punishment fits the crime. But they made one mistake. They sent Giovanni here too. Meaning I have the sacrifice necessary to perform the most forbidden underflow jutsu of them all. First, I'm gonna take these paralyzed heels and drag them all the way down into the slot where the memory reads your money. Next, I'm going to take Gary here and put him where the game determines brightness. And now the screen is blue. But we're not done with Gary. We're gonna pick him up again and swap him with this funny J. And make sure you're wearing your blue light moisturizer for this next one, because now the screen's really blue. Next, I'm going to take TM37 and pull it upwards to swap it with TM27. And now what we've done cannot be undone, but it was the morally correct thing to do. Because with great power comes great responsibility. How can I in good conscience become Pokemon champion and perpetuate the Pokemon League status quo knowing the eighth gym leader of the Kanto circuit is the proud leader of a terrorist organization? This kind of evil cannot be treated timidly with a couple of Pokemon battles. It has to be burnt out at the source. This is where I separate the brain from the body and kill Team Rocket once and for all. Because in truth, I wasn't banished here to the void for my crimes. I banished Giovanni here for his. And so it is that Giovanni will remain for all eternity in the void, not as a man, but as a computer, a fully functioning, properly configured computer, by the way, capable of everything any other computer in the game can do. I could deposit a Pokemon inside Giovanni, I could withdraw items from Giovanni, but it's called isolated banishment for a reason, so I really should be going. By now, you're probably getting familiar with the concept of when I move things in my bag, terrible things occur. But don't worry, for my next trick, I'm literally just leaving. It says that old saying goes, I'm going to fight fire with fire. This is Blaine, by the way, in case that wasn't obvious. Oh my god, make it stop, make it stop! And fight fire with fire I did. Growlithe, Ponyta, and Rapidash all fell to the superior flamethrower in one shot. I used Slash to safely put Arcanine in the ground, and that's Blaine defeated in less than 30 seconds. Man, this Game Boy game is so easy, you guys. Volcano badge acquired! Can you tell what I'm doing yet? Can you tell what my master plan is? And can I speed these sections up safe in the knowledge you'll just assume? Man, she's really fucking it up. Yeah? Okay, good. Because there's only so many times I can say, and then I swapped this item with this item, before both of us get really bored. I had a vision of your arrival. Oh yeah? Did it look like this? So here's Sabrina, sixth gym leader, and responsible for my favorite glitched sprite. Did I wrap reality around myself to bring her here, or did I rift walk to her? I actually don't know anymore. But what I do know is the only reason any of this works is due to my rival's name and my trainer ID influencing the things in my underflow menu. Yeah, it's all connected. Anyway, flamethrower sweep! They're all fucking dead. Marsh badge acquired. Okay, so now I just need to walk down here and... Welcome to Fuchsia City. See, I told you I was escaping the void. And if I go back inside, it's just a regular old poker center. And now I don't have to hear that anymore. And you know, since we're here in Fuchsia City, we may as well just make a stop at the gym, which is conveniently right next door to where I ended up. How did that happen? Now, Koga's gym requires you to navigate around a maze, which also entails participating in no less than three trainer battles. So I'm gonna throw away one max elixir and then scroll down to this cancel item, use it, back out, walk up two spaces, flash my Pokemon menu, and exit the wall because, come on, did you really think I was actually gonna do the maze? Flamethrower Sweel Soul Badge acquired. We're so close to my favorite favorite part of the run, you guys. So next, I'm going to take HMO5 and pull it all the way down into the memory where the game reads money, again. Then I'm going to take this cancel flower item and swap it with HMO4, pick it up, put it in brightness, whoa, pick it up again, and finally put it down here. Step up one square, throw away two of these, swap antidote with pokeballs, throw away two of these, and once again I've made this the satanic game my parents insisted it was. So you guys know what happens when you put a flamethrower to some plants, right? It's super effective. I will admit though, I hesitated to kill this vile plume because aside from Jigglypuff, this is my favorite Pokemon. Gay pride acquired. 
The end is so close now. Just a bit further. If you'll follow me outside this gym, you'll come to find this is actually Vermilion City. And now for my favorite part of the run. By putting Max Elixirs in the money slot, I can then scroll down and use this mystery item. What is the mystery item, you ask? A surfboard. Because despite being cut long before the game's release, they left behind just enough data for people like me. And by using this surfboard, I can get over to Lieutenant Surge's gym. No cut necessary. Now, Lieutenant Surge's gym requires you to press two hidden switches in succession before you can challenge him. Obviously, I am going to completely circumvent this puzzle by moving things around in my bag. And if you didn't see that coming, I really don't know what to tell you at this point, but congrats on making it this far. Thunder badge acquired. Just trust me, it was another flamethrower sweep. And I promise this little detour to Brock is almost over. You've done so well to humor me. But I really quickly just need to walk down one, right one, and then down down a couple more until I leave the gym and then I'm gonna walk back in because this is now Misty's gym in Cerulean City. Real unspiced footage, by the way. And yes, I have yet another trick to avoid unnecessary trainer battles. It's our old friend cancel item. It lets us walk through walls. Hi, you're a new face. Y yeah, how can you tell? Help. Cascade badge acquired. And finally, it's time to put an end to this quote, little detour. It's time to fight Brock, the first gym leader. And as the last bag related incident plays out to get us there, I just want to say it has been my utmost pleasure to be able to deliver to you the finest item swapping gameplay on YouTube. You are welcome. Quiet. And I'm done. All eight badges in the reverse order. Still happy to Whilst that's incredibly impressive, if I do say so myself, obtaining these badges wasn't even our end goal, if you'll remember. These badges, just like everything else, are just a means to an end. Every single step taken, every action performed, every item obtained, thrown away, and moved, even healing my Pokemon. It all came to this, to be standing here in this exact point in time and space, so that I can become Pokemon champion my way. Did I just literally walk to the end of the game? Yes. How? I, d I don't know. It just works. And now I'm Pokemon Champion. Was there ever anyone more deserving? After all, Pokemon Champions are honored for their exploits here. Thank you for watching my completely normal Pokemon Blue playthrough. Smiley face. Charizard. Hall of Fame. Hall of Fame! Rhydon! Right on this <laughs> Subscribe right now. Subscribe. 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 Watch my stream. Patreon. 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 Like the video.